Welcome to Space News from the Electric Universe, brought to you by the Thunderbolts Project at thunderbolts.info. In part one of this presentation, electric geology investigator Robert Hawthorne explored the stupendous geological feature in the American Southwest known as Upheaval Dome. As Robert explained, while standard geology favors the interpretation that Upheaval Dome was created by a kinetic impact, the hypothesis that the feature was created by interplanetary lightning finds great support in the geological evidence. This includes recent experimental research, which shows that chemical changes in rock normally attributed to impact, such as, quote, shocked quartz, are also produced by powerful lightning. Robert introduced an unusual rock associated with the Upheaval Dome site, called the Obsession Stone, whose discoverers were able to submit the rock for professional chemical analysis. In this conclusion, Robert explains why such analysis only strengthens the electric discharge hypothesis. I would like to talk about analcene now. And this is a picture of analcene from uh, Wikipedia. And you can see that it kind of resembles a, a golf ball shaped white, milky white, kind of spheres with trapezohedral faces on them, according to their crystal structure. However, when we got to show you the picture of the obsession zone, you'll see that it's quite different. But a Nalcium is classified as a zeolite. I mean, zeo meaning to boil, and light meaning or lith meaning uh, rock. And the Cassidy and Zelensky letters mentioned previously suggest a secondary processing of the mineral. Were all the strata layers in this dome processed in this manner? That was something that I wanted to try and find out. Because like I said, we have multiple rocks at different colors and uh, luster. And then in these graphs here, I just show that the, uh, these are the x-ray diffraction of the purple sample, the rock that was in the previous slide. This is the results of that sample. If you were to look at the bottom x-axis line, that is your angle, your 2 theta angle. And that's what they measure. And if you can imagine like a substrate or just a, basically any flat surface, and you've aim a, an x-ray at it, the beam will actually, should actually reflect off like an angle on, angle off kind of principle. But if you were to imagine the, uh, the ray actually penetrating the substrate and, coming, and continuing on through in a straight line and referring that to the actual reflected angle, that is actually your 2 theta angle and that's what they actually measure in x-ray diffraction. And it's the intensity of that beam that's absorbed, that's how they understand your charts here. So on the on the results chart, you have your uh, listed in numerical order from first to last, all the peaks that are listed. And then you have your, in the two that in, in the column below that, you have your intensities so that are ranked in which one's the tallest all the way down to the lowest. And from there, they actually do their uh, calculations, and that's what they came up with was the analcyme and calcite. I, though, wanted to uh, go a little bit further in trying to prove that the uh, multiple layers were had this electrical discharge machining performed on multiple layers simply because of the different colors of the rocks that we have. So I was given the opportunity uh, while I was attending the Salt Lake Community College enrolled in their electronics engineering program. One of my classes uh, offered a microscopy lab so I was given the opportunity to take these uh, samples in and again I took two samples in, one purple and one brown and put it under the scanning electron microscope. And here are the results. This first one is from the brown sample, and I found this one rather peculiar because it had like this brush stroke or a paint swath that's made of almost entirely of molybdenum. And I, to this day, I have not been able to research if they have any kind of traces of molybdenum in the, that area of uh, southern Utah. That's and kind of what people want to always ask me about if a possible transmutation has occurred. I'd like to say that the, uh, according to the NASA, Paper that they can't really tell what the original mineralogy was, but did an actual transmutation occur? I really can't say because I don't have that kind of the technology to perform it's such a test. But I do could say that you know molybdenum in these traces, and uh, in the next couple slides you're going to see trace amounts of elements that are in there that aren't really dominant in the area of southern Utah. And this graph is just the uh, um, energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy or EDS. And this is the charge, just similar to the uh, X-ray diffraction, but this uses the spectral line of the element itself, and that's what it reads. So your, your bottom x-axis here is your energy readout from the spectral line, and each number 
is a, is a signal to the actual element that it belongs to. So you can see here with the results that you've got your hair, you have your sodium, aluminum, silicon, or rather, you know, dominant, and your oxygen, but then you also have your calcium and your carbon in your oxygen, which is your calcite. But it's just that one part of molybdenum that's just sitting there, which I, which I wanted to use this for. And this picture is just the, uh, the distribution of all these elements and the, their concentrations in their area. Now I'm going to move on to the purple sample that I used. And actually, I did take a lot of samples, but like you can see in these images, that the it's just a lot of gray dots and stuff. It's when you come across something white and reflective that you kind of want to focus on because it's something interesting. So as in here, you can see that this is a purple sample, and there's a lot more elements in this sample than the previous one. But it still has the dominant uh, analcine features with calcite. However, this also has some iron, some potassium, looks like ruthenium, and tantalum in it. And again, here's your EDS chart. The distribution of the elements is quite, it's quite a lot of them in this one. That's one of the reasons why I use this. Oh, and I also took a third image. This one had some tantalum and some indium in it as well. This was the other side of the purple because the purple sample had a fused outer crust from, I guess, being scorched. And then in, in the interior, I took another sample as well. And this is the interior. Now, on the outer fused crust, there was no indium at all in all the places that I looked. But on the interior, there is copious amounts of it, of indium inside. And that's why I found it interesting and I put it into this report. Again, your EDS chart for this sample. And the distribution of the elements. And the tantalum looks like it's just been peppered on. It doesn't look like it's been agglomerated to any other atoms in there. Just dot after dot. There's no really clustering at all. Almost with the indium, but it does look like it's been concentrated on the left-hand side of the image. So in conclusion, this presentation, I'm, I hope that I've made the argument that electrical discharge can form craters and eject material. I hope this has provided evidence that the electrical discharges can generate the temperatures and pressures required to shock qu quartz crystals. And shown you that at Fulgurites and a sample from the mineral analysis from Upheaval Dome has presented evidence of electrical discharge due to its properties. And I feel that this presentation has presented the argument which suggests another mechanism for planetary crater formation. And now I'd like to take this time to thank the many people that have helped me with this project. And I would first like to thank the, again the Thunderbolts staff with Susan Sherratt for giving me this opportunity, especially for being at the uh, Electric Universe Conference in 2017. I'd also like to thank the uh, International Multi Conference uh, for Complexity, Informatics, and Cybernetics and their staff. I would also like to thank Bruce Laybourne and Andy Hall for their uh, helping me understand electrical discharge theory and how it applies to geological formations. And I'd also like to thank, last but not least, the Salt Lakes Community College's many departments and staff. First, Salt Lake's Microscopy Lab Coordinator, Glenn Johnson, and my instructor, Wesley Sanders, for allowing me to use their labs for this presentation. I would also like to thank Jason Roberts and the Writing Department for helping me with the editing of this paper. And lastly, I'd like to thank the Salt Lake uh, Print Shop for recovering the faded X-ray diffraction papers, because by no means was that an easy task. Thank you. <music>